I'm going to begin by reading from the beginning of the book. Um, <clears throat> so here goes. At night, alone in the plaza, you could lean your body back against the chamfered corners of the aluminum facade, roll your head back, and look straight up the side of the building. It was like lying on your back in the middle of an aluminum road. It was vast, and in that vastness, more closely resembled a naturally occurring phenomenon than something man-made. And there were two of them. You could stand in the space between them, where the air vibrated with silent energy, and imagine you were standing between the tines of a tuning fork. Clouds would catch on the upper floors as they passed over the city, subtly altering the weather. They were alpine, a pair of aluminum mountains. They induced vertigo. They exceeded haptic experience. They failed as buildings, but they were brilliant as objects. Water climbs up onto the narrow swath of park in Hudson River's east embankment, washing across four southbound lanes of the West Side Highway, around landscaped medians and over the northbound lanes before pooling among the trash cans and hydrants on the corner of 27th Street. From there, the tide flows east in the grooves between cobblestones, carried first by capillary action, then forced from behind by the surge. The surface of the road disappears as the water gradually rises to the level of the concrete curb. It is late in the evening of October 29, 2012. Some water is diverted into manholes and storm drains, but not fast enough to keep pace with the rising tide as the surge pushes massive amounts of seawater up into the South Bay. The current between curbs becomes steadily stronger. The street turns into a wide, flat stream. Gradually, the water breaches the curbs and flows over the sidewalk. Water backs up against the thresholds and weather stripping and sandbags finding its way through gaps into buildings where it crosses polished concrete floors, seeps between floorboards, pools, and electrical outlets, and bloats the papered edge of sheetrock walls. Once inside the building, the water seeks its own level, finding new spaces to fill, descending staircases, and cascading through trap doors into the cellars below. The basement spaces are not watertight. Circulation vents, air returns, and unsealed ceiling plenums allow the air, and now the water, to flow freely between underground rooms. In HVAC parlance, these spaces are in communication. So as water fills one section of the basement, it fills them all. Every door on the street is the source of a small tributary that runs into a cavernous cellar, an underground swimming pool the size of a city block. Approximately 2,000 square feet of this basement was under lease, along with a corresponding ground floor space directly above, to a small art gallery owned by Nina and her business partner, Danielle. Accessed through a large trap door on the floor, the gallery's viewing room, their underground... I'm <clears throat> sorry. Access through a large trap door on the floor of the gallery's viewing room, their underground space held all of the back of house fittings typical of the trade. Pegboards with spirit levels, spackling knives, tape measures rolls of low adhesive masking tape, hex keys, white cotton gloves, and utility knives hanging in neatly organized rows, gray steel shelves stacked with digital projectors and media players with international adapters, <clears throat> large rolls of acid-free glycine, custom forms, ammonia-free plexiglass cleaner, a tube of mascara, a box of tampons, a lint roller, aluminum Z-clips and brass D-rings, foam blocks and an expired oyster card, and stickers printed with empty or fragile or do not open with knife in thick, bold capitals. There were prints stored in flat files and paintings stacked in plywood crates with stenciled graphics or filed neatly in carpet, carpeted storage racks, each with labels explaining details of provenance. The insurance company had suggested that all the work be lifted no less than 18 inches above the basement floor in anticipation of an unprecedented weather event. In an abundance of caution, Nina and Danielle had doubled the figure and secured all of the work at least three feet above the floor. I had just moved back to New York from Los Angeles to live with Nina, and I had spent the days leading up to the storm unpacking books and trying to find room for sh to hang shirts in her apartment's crowded closets. As the night wore on, the level in the basement quickly passed 18 inches, then 36, then 72. It lifted the wood stair to the basement upward, uncoupling it from its hardware and setting it adrift. When the water rushed between the drawers of the flat file, 
Air pockets trapped the back of the metal cabinet, forced the massive file off the ground completely, causing drawers to slide open and release their contents into the encroaching tide. Later, when the surge receded, these cabinets would look as though they had been dropped from two stories. Drawers buckled under their own weight in a heap more than 20 feet southwest of where they had begun. When the water flowing through the trapdoor into the basement had nowhere else to go, it backed up onto the first floor, submerging the bottoms of office chairs, filing cabinets, bookshelves, and power strips. By this point, it was a brackish mixture of salt, sewage, dirt, motor oil, and trash rinsed from the street in the cavernous basement spaces no one had seen, much less cleaned, in decades. The cut tide continued to rise, pushing a grimy high water mark on the storefronts to 16 inches above street level. It would reach as high as 50 inches elsewhere in the neighborhood. Stop there. Um, thanks. So that testing. That's the the opening of the book, which um, um, Ellis you described as a kind of bio biography of Yamazaki. Although there is there is a biography of Yamazaki in it, it seems like it's always seemed like the book is to me not uh, not a biography, not a book about architecture. It's a kind of um, it inscribes itself within the, the kind of great urban novel. Uh, urban novels, that tradition of um, books where the city is the principal character, um, like a kind of love letter to a city, in this case New York, in this case kind of principally bracketed by 9-11 and the flood of 2012, so two great moments of destruction, um, I suppose one very directly human made, the other one a climatic one, which now we know. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I just wanted to kind of maybe start by asking you about the conception of the book and the various parts, because the other really important element is its memoir. It's a kind of a story of your experience in New York, the, um, the forming of your relationship with your partner, um, your own relationship to architecture, childhood. So there's a kind of a whole constellation of different narratives, different ways of writing. How did, how the, how did the whole thing come about? Um, I'm trying to think about how to approach this answer. I mean, I think the whole thing came, it began, in a sense, you know, with this event of the flooding of the gallery, and um, which happened at a point in my life and in my career as an artist specifically where I had I was kind of reaching this moment and I'd seen so many artists who were older than me kind of reach this moment in the sort of end of the beginning of their career right you know where where some of the initial kind of energy and interest was starting to wane and they were sort of entering in kind of doldrums and and what as a younger artist looking at those friends, you know, um, what I could discern was that the ones that were the happiest in that moment, the ones that were least happy in that moment were the ones who kept doing the same thing, kept making the same work. And the ones who were thriving were the ones who had found a way to sort of pivot. Um, sorry, I hate that word. It's such a, like, a Silicon Valley word. But, you know, to turn, to take them, to move their practice in a different direction. And so that was on my mind at some level. And it was on my mind when this gallery flooded and the, um, I met Jane, who was Nina in the book, who is my partner who owned the gallery because she represented a lot of friends of mine who were artists. So immediately after the, this hurricane, I found myself spending months dragging these objects that had been made by people who were very close to me out of this you know, basement into a dumpster trying to salvage them. Some things were okay, some things were completely destroyed, some things had literally just vanished. Um, and it just felt to me like it was a moment when making objects, making things, felt to me like an incredibly crazy way of communicating, right? Like just putting these giant, cumbersome objects out into the world. And I wanted to do something that was a little bit more, um, l like less material, I guess. So that set me down on this path of this idea, very 
loosely of writing. Uh, it took me about two years to kind of finish the commitments I had made in the, to make artwork. And when I did, I started this writing project that wasn't originally going to be about Yamasaki at all. It was more about, um, originally it was about sick building syndrome, which then led me to kind of think about architects who had struggled with illness themselves, which led me back to Yamasaki. And I had always been slightly, you know, I'd always been intrigued by him in part because I moved into this apartment right below the World Trade Center immediately after I finished architecture school. And I'd find myself just standing there looking at these really extraordinary buildings and thinking it was weird that I had no idea who designed them. Like, why did nobody teach me in architecture school who designed these two buildings? And slowly, over time, I connected him back to Prudigo, which, of course, I was aware of, but no, I never knew that he was involved. The Eastern Airlines Terminal in Boston, which is a building I loved as a kid. Uh, and then it was sort of through that process, and I apologize for this very long answer, it was through that process that I was like, oh, like, shit, this is the person that I need to put at the center of this book, meaning Yamasaki, because his story is such an interesting one, but I didn't want it to just be um, a book about him. You know, I wanted to bring these other components into it. Well, I mean, it's interesting that the... I mean, the, um, many of the themes in the book actually have been evoked this afternoon. Of Absolutely. Categori categorization. Um, I think Paddy was talking about Robin Walker being on the periphery. I mean, Yamazaki kind of never... Super successful, but never really accepted into the canon. Totally. <laughs> um, you know, for lo lots of reasons that you go into, ones of race, ones of, um, you know, to do with being a Japanese-American in that kind of post-war um, period, probably... And style, too. I was going to say, yeah. a certain sensitivity yeah. and kind of, you could say, slightly light craftsmanship and the decorative. I mean, I think that that would be something, you know, that, let's say, some of the things that, that, that Pablo uh, talks about in totally. those illustrations, yeah. those pattern books, there was something that wasn't entirely serious. Right, maybe right. Maybe within, within the architectural canon. Um, and um, all of, the, and I think that one of the things that to me gave the book so much energy is that it feels like a book written. It really feels like a book written by somebody who makes things physically, mm. who's then trying to make things l less material, as you just put it. You know, the, that introduction about right, the less the material with like an obsession with, with material. The, yeah, an yeah. obsession. The, the the description of the flood. I think soon after that passage in the book, all the artworks in the gallery, uh, and and all the equipment that keeps the white cube going. Mm. The kind of this the insane world of the white white cube um, space, um, all the fillers and and um, knives and mm. cordless drills and all of that, that then suddenly it's just down to things that sink, things that float, things that dissolve, things that rust. Right. And all of these artwork, all of this kind of equipment is now has been reorganized by the flood. And it's got, there's a kind of new material order mm. um, um, post-flood. And that runs um, all the way through the book at lots of scales, so from a storm to um, a mitre. Yeah. You know, um, and was that, was that a kind of conscious thing to thread what I understand to be your works, which are sort of essentially sculpture, into the narrative as a kind of a continuity of practice in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think it was conscious in, like, I sat down at the desk one day and I was like, I better tie this all together. I mean, it, was just, it just has to do with how I... I think it has, has to do with how I see the world and how I notice things. And I think I was very aware, as I was writing about Yamasaki, that, like, you know, I'm not um, an architectural historian, you know? It's not, I'm not a journalist, like... I don't have... So when I, if I felt like I was writing too much like one of these other figures, I would pull back and be like, no, I've got to try and write like me, sort of. Um, and, and that involves a lot of this sort of physical description, looking at, like, close kind of looking at objects and how things are, are made. I just think it's a space where I'm comfortable writing. You know, like, I don't feel as, my, as though I'm someone who's, like, great at capturing the essence of a conversation between 
two people, but like I, I can describe the hell out of like a corner where it meets like a, you know. Uh, and I, but I think that, I mean, I'm saying that sort of facetiously, but, but there was this really, really like pivotal moment in this process when I had made the leap to write this book and I was kind of two years into it and uh, very pleased with myself for like having decided to embark upon this book that would be the first book about Yamasaki written in English in 40 years, right? And um, a friend sort of very reluctantly called me at one point and told me that um, somebody else was writing a book about Yamasaki and that it was much further along than mine. And I was like, fuck, I just like, you know, I've just completely sabotaged like a decent art career and like made this giant leap and now somebody else is doing it. But it was, it ended up being one of those like beautiful moments where like a project kind of like tells you what it wants to be because the point was that this guy who I've become friends with and who wrote this really magnificent, totally comprehensive monograph took the burden of doing that off of my shoulders. I no longer had to account for everything that Yamasaki built and I could build this, like write this much more personal book, which is what I wanted to write anyway because I want it to be you know, about the way my experience with architecture and with the built environment, which is like much more personal and I I hadn't, yeah, I wanted, it, it sort of allowed me to write the book I wanted to write. Um, I mean, I wanted to come on to um, what one of the main themes of the book is, is to do with sort of health and in ill health. Yeah. Um, the city as a body, um, the uh, kind of building as a body, and then a human being, and particularly your partner in relation to mm. uh, migraines and um, uh, and so on. But I just wanted to just stop back um, with um, uh, Yamazaki uh, for a moment, because there you really somehow, again, this idea of being very, very close to being an architect is is there when you talk about the way that his buildings are made, but it goes right the way through into the account of his, of his life, even the, the archive, um, and the way in which you describe the drawings, the documents, all of that has this kind of spatial, spatial mm -hmm. implication. And I think there are very few pictures in the book, but they're kind of like, like in the sort of biography, they're all kind of grouped together right. in the center of the book. And there's one, maybe it's worth even... Even sort of open and show, which is okay, tell me which one though. Um, okay, <laughs> it is of the lattice. It is the atrium oh, yeah, yeah. of a ya Yamazaki building, and of a kind of diagrid lattice, glazed roof. I'm getting that. And um, what? Mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there are a couple of good ones, but um, it's essentially a picture of a catalogue about the work of Yamazaki, and it's, um, it's a, a, a glazed roof in the atrium of an office building, but it overlays exactly onto the lattice roof of the Seattle Library right. in which you're reading it. Right. And then, at your, in fact, your fingers are covering the thumb that is holding the My fingers the are covering my fingers. It, your yeah. thing, and it's the moment where you suddenly click that this run, that the body is running through all of this right. from from right. you as the like chronicler of Yamazaki of New York. You also talk about how Yamazaki had measured the Twin Towers mm. according to his shoulders, um, but in a very kind of non, in a very kind of almost um, anti-modernist way. This was not the, mo the modular. This was not Vitruvian mm. Man. This was everything is slightly sideways in terms of yeah. this kind of thickness, edges, proportions, which is kind of what makes him a kind of a, uh, one of those people who was not talked about really during his career compared with his peers. Right. Um, and is that something, was that something that you connected with Yamazaki, did you connect with Yamazaki's work on some of those? Yeah, qualities? I mean, I think it was, you know, one of those, it's one of the things that's just, I mean, as, I, as I mentioned before, it was kind of through this idea of illness that I arrived back at him in the first place. But there is this way that his struggle with his own health, he had suffered from really terrible ulcers and then later stomach cancer. But um, he was also afraid of heights, 
right? So there he's just designing the two tallest buildings in the world and really un fundamentally uncomfortable above seven stories. And this is where, what, as Tom alluded to, he, he m m wanted the windows of the World Trade Center to be n narrower than the width of his own shoulders, which were quite slight. And so he, you know, in so doing, kind of inscribed his own body onto the facade of the two tallest buildings in the world at the time. And, and, and I think in a way to actually tie this back to what, you're, what you mentioned at the very beginning of the question, at that point where I realized I was not writing a monograph and I could allow these other things to come in, the first thing that really kind of clicked for me was my, my, my partner, Jane, who is Nina in the book, her experience with chronic migraines and just like I, it, as I was writing, it was this time where I was reading a lot about migraine, trying to understand it better. But it was also, it also, I realized that that process had taught me so much about her experience of the built environment and how it differed from my own. I tend to be sort of a person who just like, just physically like pushes through things and doesn't, I'm not like a highly sensitive person in the way that she is and the way you, the way that her like when you ha have migraine uh you you're conscious you're keyed into all of these environmental factors that i pay no attention to and it, that helped like trying to see that world through that perspective also helped me to kind of embody you know see how yamasaki was approaching these things too because i think everything about his physical person informed how he designed. And also it seems like one of the themes that comes out of the Yamasaki story is essentially his humanity. That, yeah. that, that, and maybe that's also one of the things that kept him kind of essentially outside of the project, the big project. Um, um, but there's also um, uh, an element that I thought was really interesting in the book in which is kind of relates to measure and Yamazaki then versus now. So you're talking about Yamazaki, Pru-Aigo that gets destroyed, um, many actually really amazing buildings that I hadn't heard of um, mm. in the kind of Midwest and stuff. And then the Twin Towers, which of course we know what, what that's, where, what, where that leads. But, um, and the, pro the idea that the, the Twin Towers starts as a kind of public space project which is also really, really interesting. Yeah. But meanwhile, in the book, there's a real-time story, which is something to do with measure as well. Um, it's the building of the Vignoli, um, the Vignoli Pencil Tower. What's it called again? 432 Park. 432 Park. Yeah. And that building is going up as you're telling the story of everything going down. Right. Um, and it's happening in real time while you're, it, or it feels, it really No, it is. It actually is like the only, th it's sort of, it happened almost from, from foundation to completion, sort of in the time that I was writing the book. So it becomes this kind of, you can so measure where you are in the book by the height of this And out of the, these kind of, the kind of the ruins of, of the flood, the Twin Towers and right. all of that, rises the most kind of insane monument to real estate to capital. Yeah, well, to private wealth, really. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, um, you know, the World Trade Center could be considered a monument to capital, but, yeah. but 432 but, is to, but to somehow, private. But private. Four, 432 doesn't even, does, doesn't have an alibi right? <laughs> um, um, to, to be something else. It just is. And it also, it never hits the ground or not in any, not in the way in which the book opens when you've got you right. know, leaning against it and you really feel it as an object. You don't really feel it as an object because it's somehow buried. Somewhere. It's also just, we, I mean, it's very, it's very hard to explain this because it's a question of energy. But like when you stand at the foot of that building, 432, it just doesn't work. It doesn't, like, it doesn't resonate. It, only, it resonates like from, the, you know, from a distance when you see it in the skyline. But the concrete's a little wonky if you're too close. If it's, straight, it's not as straight as it should be. Yeah, it's a strange. It's it's a it's, it's a very fascinating building because it has all these connections to the World Trade Center, weird you know square and plan, yeah. four identical facades, things like that. Um, but it also is just a sort of a symbol of a different time. And then there's that bit you know that I talk about where 
where it's like this very crude idea, but if you think about what the tallest structure in Manhattan says about where power resides at the time that it was built, you know, you could begin with like a Lenape, temporary Lenape hunting shelter. The Dutch build a military fort, which is then replaced by Trinity and Collegiate and these churches, so mm -hmm. sort of religious power, then replaced by Singer and Woolworth and these like s symbols of, of kind of industrial enterprise, enter empire state building being the kind of culminating one. And then the World Trade Center means something different. It kind of comes in the 70s and it's about this like very uncomfortable like collusion of public and private sector and that that's where power resided at that time. Uh, and now we've arrived at the moment where extraordinary private wealth is the maybe where power resides, in New York City at least. I mean, um, in that in that tower in one way and in the other the other place where the power resides is in this because the, also the art world is somehow the story of uh, your your own art practice but the art world also is the sort of the mid scale in all of this yeah you know you could say yeah. the big scale well the bigger scale is kind of the weather uh, right and the, the then the big scale is the city there's a sort of mid scale which is the kind of in the art world, and then there's a tiny scale which is actually probably, um, I mean, in some ways represented by how you make things. I mean, that mm. goes mm. on all the way through the book, but also through illness, which is yeah. at an even. Um, but the the art world and the the kind of the energy put into maintaining a certain kind of authority. You know, like whether it be the insurance companies, the white walls, the fillers, and all of that. Right. But it's it it's written as if you fill the cracks in the gallery walls. I, I think maybe, right. maybe you did. There were certainly times in my life when I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that also, the, but also the sort of big kind of the sort of glacial force in the art world in that respect is also the sort of gradual conglomeration of like galleries in New York into like essentially five m mega galleries, which has been happening really slowly and has sort of m you know made it impossible for a gallery like the one, because you know the gallery that I discuss here in the beginning recovers from the flood and like actually they get through this massive catastrophe, but then just can't stay open under the conditions of the sort of art world that make it so difficult for a small like to mid-sized gallery to just continue to survive, right? So there's, mm. yeah, there is a kind of parallel there in terms yeah, of, there's the, yeah. These kind of, the, the, the kind of economics and health yeah. lines are kind yeah. of crossing over. And then of course the health thing was, you know, incredibly complicated by the sort of arrival of this lovely pandemic right at the very end of the book, which I don't write about because it only happened at the very, I was just finishing the book as we all kind of locked down. But I think it informs, the like if you read the book now and you think about these questions of public health or like body health, building health, it's, you know, hard not to think about. Well, it's interesting because it's the book, yes, yeah, so that, that when, if you read the book now, you do, the pandemic is conspicuously absent. Right. But in a kind of way that's interesting because it feels like it's signposted all the way through the book in the way that there's a whole series of events that seem to suggest that the world is is quite sick and it could get it could get much worse. But right. it's n it's it's not signposted. It's much more um, the road is kind of uh, takes you along a series of. I mean, a series of destructions, essentially. Yeah. Um, all of which are, in some way or another, avoidable. I mean, none of them are kind of biblical. They're sort of um, human human events. This doesn't feel kind of biblical to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know exactly and, what you mean. Um, and they're not yet. Yeah, but not. it does. It does seem so. It does seem very contemporary in the sense that, you know, the conclusion. It feels like if you were to imagine your own conclusion to the book. Right. It may well look like COVID. Right. You know, right. Um, right. Although I would say that the book, is, the book is not bleak by any means. I mean, actually, it's, um, it's a kind of... Uh, the Yamazaki story is a kind of an amazing 
um, it's an amazing life, actually. It's quite. It's simple. incredible. Yeah, I mean, um, really, really extraordinary in the way that it, he kind of touches all these different moments in. Um, um, and then maybe sort of, I suppose, to close, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is um, it was very loosely alluded to a little while ago t during the break, is how does this book fit within your practice? Like, is it a, a sabbatical? Is it a new direction? Is it kind of, does it click into, like, studio work that you've been making? I mean, my hope is that in, you know, looking back 10, 10 years from now, you'll be like, oh, this is part of this kind of very coherent practice, which has involved very different sorts of things at different times. I mean, I, to me, very little about my life changed. I went to the studio and wrote a book instead of making objects. I still went to the same place to work. And it's still sort of thinking about the same things. It's just a different way of... You know, I, I like to think of it as like this kind of, this, this was this idea, and it, um, you know, the best way of realizing the idea was in the form of a book, not an object or a drawing. I was going write, Pablo, this may be something you relate to. Like, this thing wanted to be a book, and so you make it into a book. Um, I mean, I've, so I think there will still continue to be object making that happens, but there will still continue to be writing that happens. Um, so I think of it as being very coherent. Of course, the, you know, within certain contexts, particularly in the art world, people are like, you're doing what? You know, and you're just like, come on, it's just, you know, this is just a project. So, I mean, I think of it as being being all part of a whole. And and so in that context, how do you feel about the fact that it, it sort of landed in Archie world? Well, I mean, that's because, you know, as... Sam and Tom and I learned the hard way, you have to just write, you have to put a little word on the back of the book here, you know, and so that the people in the bookstore know where to put it. And, and um, you know, I think it's, as you alluded to, and you, we spoke about it a little bit at lunch today, it's hard to kind of explain exactly what's going on in this book. It is certainly a book about Yamasaki. And I think also because it came out so close to the anniversary of 9-11, you know, that was the easiest way to kind of latch onto it and talk about it. So uh, it certainly landed in the architecture world, but I like to think that it will, it, it will seep its way into others. It just might take a little while for people to find it. I hope. Yeah. Um, I mean, on that sort of, I suppose, kind of architectural note, maybe um, one of the things that uh, readers would discover is, in fact, that you were standing at the foot of the Twin Towers when they were hit. Right. And that is described... Um, uh, the description of that moment is really one of the kind of sort of spatial high points. It's an incredibly spatial description of the whole mm. thing. It's, sort of, it's less a kind of internal monologue, more a kind of a three-dimensional real-time event, um, which I would really... I think is that's, that is somewhere sort of in the second half I think yeah um, uh, and is a completely amazing thing and you also describe and I think this is one of the things that I th the book I think is has is very well charged on. you describe how you're standing there taking photographs but you don't the photographs are not in the book right um, maybe as a last word can you just say a little bit about like or even where where are those photographs and who are they for now? Yeah, I mean, I, the nine eleven is such a tr you know it, it 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 it's such an important part of the Yamasaki story, right? You just have you have to honor the fact that this one man designed two hugely influential projects that were both blown up on live television, right? I mean, that's like a very astonishing coincidence. But the, but you also have to honor the fact that they were the two probably least representative buildings of his work on the whole, right? They don't look, like, you know, they're not, neither looked really like a Yamasaki building. Um, and so you have to kind of always hold those things in balance. And it's very difficult, you know, if you, a certain amount of, ink, a certain amount of description of 9-11 makes something into like a 9-11 book, and there are too many of them, and they're 
generally terrible, and, and especially using 9-11 as like a literary device, I think is, is quite um, tired at this point. So I was trying very hard not to do that. I needed to honor the, like the fact that I was there and that that was really central to my understanding of Yamasaki. But I think that putting the, the one particular, the particular picture that I described, which is quite spectacular, putting that in the book would have just kind of like sucked the air out of the room in a way. And, and it would have been sort of, you know, it's also such a violent image and, you know, sort of violent to Yamasaki through his building. And so, I, you know, I chose, there's a lot of cases where I'm describing images that are not pictured and I picture things that are not described. And that to me is more interesting than describing something and then also putting the picture in there. And so it seemed like the smartest thing to do was to keep it out. Um, it's l maybe a little bit on the kitsch side, but to end, could you tell us where the title comes from? Because I think it describes a way of seeing, which I think is, to me, fundamental, is, is the spirit of the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, because th this is exactly the kind of thing where I didn't want to include it in the book, right? But, like, you know, we can talk about it now here. Um, but just to preface that, I think one of the things that was... Uh, so the, the, the title is my daughter, who is... Zoe in the book, Rosie in real life, uh, was about three at the time when I was writing, and she was looking for uh, an hourglass for a board game, like, a, you know, in Boggle or something. And she asked me where the sand future was. And it just, like, it was one of those kind of, like, lightning strike moments where you're like, God, that is the most fucking beautiful thing. And, and I just put it in as the placeholder title um, because... Uh, I was very committed, and I think Tom Weaver has my back on this one. We were both very committed to having a title for this book that was not like, this is the thesis of the, this is the subject of the book, colon, this is the thesis of the book. We were really trying to like push people at MIT Press like to the edge of their comfort zone, and I think we succeeded in you know making this feel not like you're picking up an architecture book, but you're picking up something closer to a novel, and uh, you know, sand features stayed on the front of the manuscript and eventually it kind of just grew into being like, you know, after t over time, I was like, that's just the perfect title. 